All right. So we'll be um, we'll be talking about the uh, the replacement to fast that we've been working on since January. Well, actually, earlier than that. And um, and yes, that's going to be in production. Hopefully by the end of the year. Well, certainly by the end of the year. Hopefully by the end of like, October, for example. So soon. Um, here is a bit about us. So I'm going to uh, be introducing myself because why not? Um, I've been a Ferra contributor since uh, basically since it's called Ferra. And uh, hey, Stephen, can you talk now? Can you hear me? Oh, that's fantastic. And you're only one, Stephen. Okay, perfect. Um, I was Great. just I, I just I was just arriving on that slide, which is pretty much the first one. So do you want to pick it up? Sure. Yeah, we can. Did you introduce yourselves already? Or I, I was just uh, saying a couple of words about myself, but it's all on the screen. So uh, feel free to uh, unshare the screen if I manage to do that. Yep. Yes. But I, I can okay. actually finish that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been I've been working on the infrastructure team uh, since uh, 2012, and uh, and I've been the tech lead on the on the replacement AA project. So um, yeah, people got got to ask me questions, and I got to tell them weird answers, and that was fun. And that's about Christian, it. I'm part of the free APA team. Started right at like a bit more than five years ago. And uh, I was the person who acted as a liaison between the IPA team and the CPE team and helped the CPE team to develop uh, the plugins and uh, similar technical issues and uh, recommendations. Hey, uh, I'm Steven, the one having AV problems. Uh, I joined the CPE team at Red Hat about a year ago. I was at Red Hat for about two years before that. Um, I came in with little to minimum Python experience uh, and Node and JavaScript was my background, but like I said, don't hold that against me. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about the, the fast replacement um, and I suppose a good way to start off is why, why was it actually being replaced in the first place? Um, so there's a number of reasons. Um, some of the smaller ones are it's based on the TurboGears framework uh, that's lost quite a bit of traction and um, doesn't have a huge community. A lot of the, the, the code base is Python 2 only um, and a lot of new stuff that we would have liked to use is obviously Python 3 so it didn't make sense to, to stay Python 2. Um, one of the bigger reasons was that Fast only was supported on RHEL 6 which was released 10 years ago. Um, and actually goes end of life this November, I believe. Um, so, yeah, obviously it would be nice to have a fully supported version going forward and, and get patches and things like that uh, in a timely manner. Um, also, it's it's quite a large application, FAST. Um, makes, makes it difficult to work on, makes the maintenance hard, um, and it just, in general, complicates the workflow. Uh, so it doesn't also have a huge... Um, it's, it's not kept up to date at the moment because of some of the previous reasons I just mentioned as well. So all of those kind of combined into, let's replace it. So just before I joined this team, there was um, a small team put together to investigate what the options were. Uh, they compared a lot of different solutions, um, some from AWS, I believe, and things like that. So. Uh, free IPA was the the winner, and that's where Christian came in. Um, I won't, so, uh, I won't go into year, the yeah. pros, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So last, last year we were contacted so by members of the CPE team, and they were asking uh, free IPA would be a potential solution. So the old file system already uses free IPA in the background for some things. And we had a longer debate, and me and another co-worker then also pushed from our side and convinced our own management chain that it would be a good idea to support uh, FAS and free IPA at the new solution for FAS. For one, it's open source, so the other solution were commercial solutions. Uh, we know how to extend and improve free IPA, and for us as engineers from the IPA side, it's also 
a great way to have a good showcase for customers and other communities, and also to see how free IPA works like in the real field. So at engineers, we usually don't get to see how customers use free IPA. And we know that there are pretty big installations right, with over 100,000 users, but we don't get to see them, uh, get, don't get to interact with them directly. One of the cons that we saw is that, um, so self-hosting is an issue. Um, getting that offloaded to a commercial solution would probably get some resources off, but Red Hat IT is already familiar with hosting that because Red Hat internally also is moving for free IPA. And long-term maintenance costs, so it's hard to see if paying a commercial distribution, commercial system for that would pay off at the end or not, but at least that way, uh, we have that all in-house developed. So, thank you. Great. So, yeah, obviously this, this move is going to uh, affect a lot of different people. Um, three main groups really, the actual end users. Uh, so anybody who uses the fast system at the moment is obviously going to have a new UI to kind of feel their way around and figure out how things work. Um, we hope that it feels natural and homely. Uh, our UI expert trying has put a lot of effort into that. So let us know. Um, yeah, some other things like group membership requests are manual for the moment. Um, so yeah, it's kind of similar to how it works at the moment anyway. Um, another thing is, and I'll talk about the migration in a minute, but once we do migrate, just check your name, check that your name works because names were hired. Uh, so yeah, we had to work around that. Um, another group that it's going to affect is application developers. So gone are the days of the admin user and password. It's now key tabs in Kerberos. Uh, your application should have its own key tab and that's how it's going to communicate with the back end. Uh, it's a REST API that we've also worked on and Aurelian is going to talk about that REST API in, in a further slide. Um, I suppose the next group it's going to affect is system admins. Um, they're probably going to reap the most benefits. They are going to have a lot easier management of, of users and groups um, thanks to free IPA specifically and also just because of free IPA, they're going to have a much more fine grained control over what they can do. They're going to be able to do a lot more as well as be able to do it in a finer grain control way. Um, and they also, everybody loves scripting, so they're going to have um, access to a better CLI and a better CLI tool uh, and, and a much improved API as well, a much more extensive API. So what is the roadmap for the, the complete AAA look like. Um, so there's two things that we're hoping to have complete by August 18th, which is just a little under two weeks away. Um, and that's that the solution is deployed to staging and the first pass at user data migration. So there was a question in the chat um, about data migration. So yes, that is part of this. And what we hope to do is have the first migration run by the 18th or maybe begin at the 18th, I'm not, yeah, probably begin at the 18th, um, but also to continue until basically that, until FAST goes read-only. Um, so it'll be run on a, maybe on a cron job or every X number of days. Um, once that happens, then we love community interaction. So get involved, help us test. There'll be email on, emails on all the lists. Um, and we're going to have two testing phases. So a testing phase and then uh, patch fixes and then another testing phase and then patch fix again and that'll take us right up until October 20th um, and again once those are complete you can also get involved and help us fix whatever has been found that'd be that'd be great uh, once that's done then we're going to deploy to production by November 3rd hopefully um, it's at this point then as well fast is going to be made read only um, and that's just to help us kind of reduced any rights after the fact when we've already done the migration and things like that. So we'll be in production and fast will be read only. It's, and it's also as well, cause there's a lot of applications using fast and we don't want to just break those instantly. They're going to have a, a, a window to, to migrate, which I'll also talk about. So then November 30th fast just gets turned off unplugged. 
So some of the design goals, um, one of them was obviously to keep the, the workload light on admins and stuff. So a lot of it is to be self-service so users can register, edit their own information, change passwords, uh, OTP tokens, things like that. Um, and without having to go through a ticketing system, they can do it themselves. We, we did keep some operations on demand, so that's uh, manual process. And um, that's kind of to keep, if, if group creation was free for all, it would be, there'd be as many groups as there are people and that's just not helpful to anybody. Um, yeah, and, and another design goal was again, to come back to, to the admins to allow them to do a lot more, a lot easier. So the web UI that FreeIPA gives us is pretty powerful. Um, and also we have Red Hat's backing, uh, which is great from even just a training point of view. There's loads of training for free IPA, which is brilliant for free, for admins. Um, and yeah, the last design goal is for devs that if they don't have to work on the IDM stuff, then they can focus on other things. They don't have to, because IDM, I can tell you from my limited experience with LDAP, IDM is difficult. So as Christian can attest, uh, not for Christian, for everybody else, LDAP is very difficult. <laughs> it's like a it's like a completely different language. It's different, not difficult, but yeah. <laughs> I'll explain a bit later about LDAP in my slides. Cool. So yeah, obviously we had some technical challenges, most of which we foresaw before we started. Um, the first one I was involved with was the actual data migration from FAST to, to free IPA. Um, I think there's, last time I checked, there was 65,000, 70,000 FAST accounts. So we had to come up with a way to actually migrate those along with the, I think two or 3,000 groups that exist in FAST and do it safely. Um, because another issue was that it's, this solution is going to host CentOS information as well. So it's to make that, those, make those schemas play together safely. Um, um, and then we also had some, like, we wanted to make sure that once one group's schemas didn't upset another group's, like we wanted to make sure that if OpenSUSE wanted to add something that they could and it wouldn't, nothing would conflict. Um, and then teaming stuff as well. So to make it so that all three can be teamed separately if they like, uh, which we've done. Then, like I said, CentOS, we had, um, we're going to have in CentOS people who have also have accounts in FAST. Even, even though CentOS uses FAST, it's a different FAST instance. So there's going to be duplicates. Like I have an account on both. So when my account is migrated, we need to make sure that that happens safely. Um, yeah, and then there are some incompatible properties between FAST and free IPA. Like I previously mentioned the names. So FAST allows people to, I think I have it written down, there was three main issues um, where you might either have one name, no name on FAST. There was two accounts that had just no names at all. Um, or you could have greater than two names. So I think the highest I saw was eight. There was somebody who had eight names or nine names. So we need to take that into account because free IPA expects a first name and a last name only. Um, and then, yeah, there was also, we put together a list of applications that currently use FAST. And that was, I can attest for somebody who's new to the, the community, that was a, a long list of applications to try and get my head around. And first of all, to actually list, and then secondly, to figure out what each was doing, how it was doing it, and what needed to happen for it to migrate to the new API. Um, yeah, and I think that was, yeah, we just wanted to make sure nothing broke there. So that was that was definitely a technical challenge. So I'm going to pass over to Aurelian. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Um, it worked a couple of minutes before, so of course it's going to work. All right, so um, architecture. Um, so these are the, the applications that are composing the new uh, the new solid system. Uh, we've talked about free IPA a bit, and we're going to talk more about it in the, in the next minutes. Uh, it's basically our data store. 
that's where all the data is located and it gives us also access to this data in various protocols. We have an extensions to an extension to free APA called free APA fast. It's basically a plugin that gives us specific data that we need for fa for Fedora, but it's not needed anywhere else. So there's that. Ypsilon, you already know it because you've been using it for a while already. Um, it's uh, it has uh, uh, it's the, the the login frame that you're using currently to access web applications. Noggin is a new app. It's going to be the self-service user portal. So that's where users are going to log in, um, set their settings, change their password, um, join well, view groups and request to join them, that kind of thing. So it's all for users. FastJSON, on the other hand, is a, is a, a REST JSON API. So it's only for applications. Uh, of course, it can be your applications because we know you write stuff. And, um, and since we have a separate backend in free APA, we can have applications that are dedicated to users on one side and applications on the other side, FastJSON. FastJSON client is just a client for, for FastJSON that makes it a bit easier to use. REST JSON is already pretty easy to use, but we have something even nicer. Um, and FAST2 IPA is a migration script. So how, this is how it, it's all connected. Um, you start with a nice user that is very happy on the left upper hand, and that uh, the user can first uh, by following the. I'm going to follow the first. You see my, my yeah. You see my mouse here. Okay. So um, it can access Noggin, the user interface that is going to contact Free APA via the Python API that we're using in Noggin. And the Python API and LDAP are connected together in Free API. We have our plugin here, and um, and applications are go maybe using the FastJSON client. They can also access Fast directly because FastJSON client is Python, but you may want to access Fast from anything, and so they may want to access FastJSON over HTTP. That is totally fine. And FastJSON is also using the Python API, but it's also calling LDAP directly. Um, it's using the Python API for just one small thing that is kind of hard to do in LDAP, but you don't really need to do to know that. <laughs> um, FastJSON has a, a CLI that is currently only used to generate cert certificates, and that's mostly for the CentOS users. Uh, CentOS users use um, Koji with cert client certificates as we used to do a few years ago. Um, before we move to Kerberos. So they still need that, and uh, that is going to be available via the CLI. Noggin and FastJSON are going to run in OpenShift. And um, and yeah, that's it. Yeah, Free API doesn't really run in OpenShift, and also you would you would have some kind of chicken and program problem with uh, who is going to uh, answer the, the queries for access in, in OpenShift. It, yeah, we don't do that. Uh, it's going to have its own VM. Also, so fast JSON. Um, Noggin doesn't really need much explanation because it's really made for users, and uh, you should be able to use it without much of a, a, an explanation or a manual. And if you can't manage to use it with an explanation, then uh, it's a documentation bug, and we should fix it, or a UI bug. Uh, fast JSON is a REST API. That's how you'd get uh, data from Free APA in your applications. You are authenticated via Kerberos. So if you're a user and you want to make an API request, you can just uh, K in it, and you'll have the ticket that is going to be used to communicate with uh, Fast JSON. But if you're an application, you use key tabs. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but if not, we have documentation for that also. Uh, you'll get JSON responses. You have a few endpoints right now, basically getting a user, getting a list of users, getting a group, getting a list of groups, searching users, and uh, getting your certificate signed. It has pagination, which is something that was really lacking in FAST. Um, so there's a lot of applications that were querying FAST by um, querying all users starting with A, then all users starting with B, et cetera, et cetera, because it didn't have any pagination. Um, that's fixed. And it also follows the open API spec and has this Swagger UI, you know, this nice uh, JavaScript UI that you can explore, that lets you explore the, the API. Uh, I will send you the link to the FastJSON docs. There will be links at the end if you need that. Um, the client is an, just an easier way to query FastJSON. 
um, from Python. It's Python. It will check that you are authenticated with Kerberos properly. It will code, you will just be able to call methods instead of making HTTP requests and you'll get dictionaries and lists directly. You can, you'll have pagination support, like you'll have a nice object that you can uh, query for the page number, the total number of pages, uh, what the next page number is, get directly the next page, etc. And you will have a convenience method to get all the users in one call as most SaaS applications used to do before. Um, there are better ways to do that now, but if you don't want to make the loop yourself, you, there's something that does it for you. Um, it also has a CLI that will let you uh, generate certificate signing requests and get them signed by the free APA CI. No, wait, uh, CA. Um, and that's all. And I'm going to hand over the floor to Christian. Hi. So, um, Apparently, yeah, screen share is working for me. Hi. So let's get started explaining to you what actually free IPA is. So uh, now it's probably not a beer, but I like that beer. <laughs> so uh, free IPA is an open source identity management solution. That means it manages some kinds of identity. So that's users, groups, services, machines, uh, and permissions. Uh, users, as already mentioned, LLAP as a backend. Uh, we have included public key infrastructure, so a CI to create certificates for services, hosts, and users. Uh, internally, we rely heavily on Kerberos, although most users will not see much of Kerberos. We have OTP support, that's for two-factor authentication. Um, currently, no support for um, U2F, but that's uh, going to be added in the distant future. We have a, a easy-to-use web user interface that's uh, heavily JavaScript-driven. We have a command line tool written in Python. Uh, most of the things for the backends are either using JSON RPC or LDAP queries. And as we have shown, it's uh, very extensible. So you can add your own LDAP schema extension. You can feed in uh, LDAP things. You can extend the API with Python and extend the web interface with JavaScript. And if you want to play around with, with the UI, there is a demo site, ipa.demo1.freeipa.org, including if you follow the pop-up uh, login credentials so you can play around. Please don't change the admin password. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, there are lots of online training courses available uh, on the internet for Free IPA 2. So actually, Free IPA is not just one project. It's uh, standing on the shoulder of lots of giants. So uh, we have the LDAP server, we have Apache, we have Samba, we have Doctype, let's see, CA, SSSD, and the three hounds on top right, that's Kerberos. And of course, we're running on uh, Fedora, although we have also support for Pharrell, for Debian, and just a couple of months ago for SUSE. Uh, the, the core components of Free IPA, uh, again, um, the most important ones are the KDC, that's the Kerberos Key Distribution Center, uh, DocTag, that's the CA that uh, manages the certificates, uh, the 3.9DS LDAP server. Uh, we also, which we don't use in FAST, we have BIND support. So you have integrated DNS solution, including DNSSEC. Um, I don't think we use that. Uh, what else we're also not going to use in FAST at the moment is uh, Samba support for Active Directory. So you can do something like a cross forest trust and get Active Directory users into free IPA. And uh, some of the help of components are SSSD, which I will go explain in a minute, KDC proxy, and CertMonger. Uh, they are run both on so SSSD and CertMonger run also on clients. And that makes actually the life of any administrator uh, very easy because uh, all the hard things like getting users created on different machines is now handled by Free IPA and SSSD and CertMonger. So when you create a user, uh, a POSIX user in um, Free IPA in a POSIX group, then you will actually see them as standard groups in your Linux machines. And if you upload uh, your SSH public keys to users, uh, then uh, they will magically appear when you log in. So you can just use uh, SSH keys for logging in or can use the 
uh, your Kerberos credentials to log into hosts using SSH. Um, there's also rich uh, host-based access control, so you can control which member of a group is allowed to access which kind of services on on hosts. It's very very fine grained, including like uh, defining groups of hosts where you can define and access different services. I have two-factor authentication, and for the, the, those people are worried about like Kerberos and how to configure and set up Kerberos on your machines. The good news is if you have default configuration, allow DNS auto configuration, then you get zero config Kerberos. So you just do something like username at and capital letters fedoraproject.org uh, with K in it, and K in it will then ask you for your uh, credentials. Um, you're good. So that works out of the box. So um, this integration with SSD and SwordMonger make the life of admins easier and they plug it into sex like NSS and PAM and sudo NSH. And with the one of the core components, uh, which makes uh, Free IPA for some people a bit awkward to use is LDAP. And so this slide actually started by one of by our coworkers. Uh, so um, and he put in like not regular SQL database. And I kept that because that basically sums up LDAP a lot. So if you're coming from SQL, um, then LDAP was like very awkward to you, but it's not that complicated. It's more like a particle address book database or a fancy schema uh, driven key value store. So on the right side, you see like an LDAP tree. It's really good tree form. And the nice thing about LDAP is it's a pretty old protocol and it's heavily standardized. So it's not like MySQL or Postgres where you have different drivers, different binary protocols, or each application has its own like database tables. Uh, the schema and the protocols are all standardized and that works, works mostly. Uh, Alab is also not very well optimized for writing. It's more done for heavy reading and replication of data across multiple LDAP servers. So if you do lots of writing with LDAP, you're probably doing it wrong. And it's extensible, so you can both extend the schema and even the protocol uh, with additional features. So uh, we have one extension for RBA, for example, where you can send a server control and telling you, when you log in that you uh, require that the user also has during login supplied a two-factor authentication token. And the LPO would just refuse to uh, let people in without two-factor authentication. And we do a lot of access controlling and permission checks on the server side, which makes um, that rather special because um, I'm going to explain that uh, on the slide after that slide. So, the LDAP schema is like the, the table layout uh, you, to compare that to SQL. Uh, so in LDAP, we don't have like tables and rows and columns. We have entries. And uh, entries have like a distinguished name. Uh, they have uh, an object class or usually multiple object classes, and they have attributes. And object class is just an attribute, but a rather special one. Uh, the DN, distinguished name, is kind of a unique identifier and also a path that shows where the object is located in the tree. So here's an example for a, uh, a user in my test instance. So it's a, uh, starting from the right side to so DC fast, DC example, the root database. And then you have an account subtree with a user subtree that has a user fast user one. The object class of an entry uh, lists both the mandatory and the optional attributes. And in most cases, you can add additional auxiliary object classes to an existing entry. So you can just extend that. It's a bit like object oriented. You can even subclass an object class and create like extended subclass of an object class. Uh, all of has user attributes. So these are the attributes that an application is able to set uh, and modify. It also has something called uh, operational and auto-generated attributes. So these are internal attributes or attributes generated by internal plugins. And attributes are um, either single or multi-valued. In most cases, attributes are multi-valued. So you can have like multiple names, multiple group memberships. And they're also uh, strictly typed, strongly typed. So you have uh, different kind of text attributes, uh, both ASCII and 
UTF-8 like text, you have numbers, you have dates, you have binaries, booleans, and a special one, special kind of type is distinguished name, which is kind of like a foreign key reference in SQL, except you reference another entry by its distinguished name. And we have in 390 as a plugin that generates back references. So if you add a user uh, as a member of a group, then the user gets a member of back reference attribute automatically generated that points from member of of the user entry back to the group entry. And these are internally managed by 390S. So if you remove a user, then uh, also the group uh, gets updated and the users removed from the member entry or the other way around. And so uh, another core feature, what makes IDM for IPA usable in very large installations and makes us resilient against any kind of data center or connection issues is the fact that uh, Threat on the S is a truly multi-primary application system. So, or the old name, Master Master. And uh, it's a topology where you link multiple servers with other servers and they eventually reach a consistent state. So you update one entry and the entry then gets propagated throughout the whole cluster. And even with one or two of the uh, servers are like in maintenance or maybe the hardware failed, that's no issue. And uh, this is also one of the reasons why we have DNS built in into free IPA. We have location-based DNS, so um, including server records. So in a client tries to connect to a server, it doesn't usually connect a specific server, just get me the nearest server that's alive, and then it will be pointed to several host names, and then we'll try to connect the different hosts and get the one that responds. So uh, another core feature of free IPA, it's very fine grain when it comes to um, access control. Uh, and one thing that's also very different to what most people are used from SQLite, SQL databases like PostgreSQL, MySQL, there is no like a database user. So the web framework, the web UI, the API does not have a um, database user like you used to. It has a special kind of user uh, that is able to impersonate users uh, via credential delegation, uh, or it's called Kerberos Service or YouTube proxy. So what it means, so you connect to the front end, like to fast JSON or to free IPA with your Kerberos credentials. Um, and the database uh, then gets connected by the fast JSON uh, with the same credentials delegated through. So the actual user that queries the database is you, it's not the, the fast JSON user. And that allows us to do all the permission checks uh, inside the database. So in theory, we would be able to let anybody connect directly to LDAP and there wouldn't be any kind of permission issues or uh, privilege issues. Uh, with the role-based access control, we also have a way to uh, define who's allowed to do what very fine grain. So one example we have, we have a agreement that allows you, that you have to agree to before you're allowed to join a group. And there are permissions to add or remove agreements. Uh, they're then combined into a privilege that uh, is called fast agreement administrators. And the role fast agreement administrator has this privilege. And then you can add either users or um, a user group and give them that role. And members of that user group who have that role is able to add or remove agreements. We also have a self-service permission. So by default, the user is neither allowed to read nor modify any attribute. So you have to give users uh, explicit rights to even get a value or change a value. And there's special kind of ways to give this permission to say this is self-service um, permission. So it means you can only modify your own entries. You can't modify a like the RSC nickname of a different person. And we can also do constraint delegation of permissions. So uh, we develop uh, for uh, Fedora accounting system, a special new uh, uh, attribute called membership managers. These are group permissions, group attributes. So each group has a set of member managers and 
these member managers are allowed to modify a specific attribute and add and remove users for a group. And so this is fine grained delegation of uh, permissions. Um, that's really what we developed when we created the Free API Fast plugin. So uh, extend uh, the LDAP schema, extend the API, and extend the web interface. Uh, so, for example, we extended the users to have IRC next, to have local information, you can upload UGBG keys, additional to existing ones, and then allow users to all users to read them. So all authenticated users are able to read this information and each user is allowed to change its own RC neck. Uh, for groups, um, it's similar. There are new attributes listing RC channels and mailing lists. Uh, one rather big extension was the user agreement fields, which we're going to demo eventually at the end of the talk. Uh, so user agreements uh, are a requirement before you're allowed to join a group. Um, the framework uh, verifies that you're only allowed to join a group when you have agreed to all attached agreements for a group. And if you, if somebody, so if a, a group membership manager or a, um, a fast agreement manager removes this agreement for you, you can't even disagree from an agreement, then you get already removed. Uh, we created several new uh, permissions and access controls to do things and uh, several things that all know unique values. So in free IPA, we don't enforce that email address is unique, but in fast, we also enforce that unique addresses are uh, unique. And finally, a bit of JavaScript code. So Stephen's power scan is actually very handy. Um, so we extended the UI with JavaScript. And I think we're now to demo time. Cool. I can't hear you, Stephen. Already? Australian. Yeah. He's mute. Yeah. It was muted. Okay, perfect. <laughs> One penny in the jar. Okay. Um, so let me start with the demonstration. Um, this is how it looks currently. I, it's kind of small if you have the multi screen. Well, I don't know. You, maybe you want to click on the on the screen share to get it um, big enough. Maybe I can zoom in actually. Yeah, that should be a bit better. All right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, people can, of course, identify, but first we're going to register. Um, let's say I create an account for myself and my email address. Well, that's not much of a secret anyway. Um, this is going to send me, oh, that's nice. Okay. Let me refresh that, uh, that screen. Okay. Of course. Okay. I've been keeping that um, that page open for too long. Yeah, we have security, right? We have CSRF, CSRF tokens, great. Um, so now it's going to uh, ask me to validate my email. So I'm going to go look in my inbox slash terminal uh, what the account, what the, the validation link was. Um, Yeah, so that's a long link with a token, or like a, a GWT token. Uh, that's nice, even better. What is this? Okay. Well, we didn't mm -hmm. pay enough to the demo, but sorry for that. Yeah, that's always happened. No, we're just showing how everything works, even in valid RF. Right, right. I, I'm trying to show you how it's very secured. Yeah. I can't even do the things I was planning to do because it's so secure. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, that is entirely normal. Uh, that is exactly what I wanted to do. <sighs> okay. There it is. 
All right, back to uh, the first thing. Copy the link. Thank you very much. Post that now. Hopefully, it's going to work. Ah, no, I got the right link. Woohoo, wonderful. Um, so now that I have proven that my email address is correct, I'm going to add to be asked uh, for a password, which is going to be very interesting. Um, and I'm going to activate my account. I don't want to, to remember that password. Thank you very much. My account has been created. I am not logged in. And uh, I, it says that I have no group membership because obviously I just logged in. Uh, that's the profile page that you will be able to see on each user. Uh, it has a few information, a few pieces of information that are useful. For example, the time zone, that's pretty useful. Uh, the current time of that user, um, and that's very useful, obviously, when you want to, to talk to, to people that are around the world, such as people in our community. There's a direct link to the, to the wiki page uh, for that user and uh, the federal people page for that user. Um, I'm going to edit my profile because I'm actually not living in UTC time zone. So let me check that. That is correct. It detected that I'm in, uh, that I'm, I speak French, but that is not correct. Uh, Europe, Paris, there it is. I can enter if uh, my website URL, I can enter my IRC nicknames here. Very surprisingly, that's a one part. That is, hmm, that's, huh. And I'll let you guess what my GitLab username is. And um, I'm going to save that and show you that on my profile. If I go back to my profile, view your profile, thank you. Now it says that I'm in Paris and it actually shows my right uh, local time. So yeah, it's 5.45 in the afternoon right now for me right now. Uh, I'm going, to, I could show you how to upload GPD, GPG keys and SSH keys and all that stuff. That's not very entirely interesting. There's the agreements thing that we've talked about before. Um, it's a bit big, so it's going to look less weird on your screen, like it should be more aligned like this. Um, I could decide to um, sign the FPCA here, so I'm going to sign it. That's the whole FPCA thing. No, it's actually not right. That's just uh, random stuff that we cut and paste it, it means absolutely nothing. But we can still sign it. I'm going to sign it. And now I signed it and it doesn't show us signed. Maybe I need to refresh this. No, we'll look at that later. Uh, one very fun thing is the, the OTP feature. So now we can have OTP tokens. Um, I'll, I'll try to demo that. Of course, it's very, very risky. So <laughs> I'm going to try it and I'm sure it's going to work first time. Um, once you get to two factor authentication with an OTP token, you can't really go back. So make sure you remember your tokens. Token name is going to be a test token. And I'm going to use my password here to prove that it's actually me um, this way. Well, if I leave my screen open and I move away to get a coffee, nobody can uh, come in and lock me out of my account by creating a token that I don't know about. So I'm going to generate it. Please don't save that. Okay, it's been generated now. I can click on reveal when I'm ready with my application on my phone that you're not going to see if you have maxed up the screen, but I can, I'm going to get to that application. So I'm using something called Aegis, but free OTP also work. Uh, that's on, on Android. And I'm going to register a new token. There it is. Aha, I got my token. I could also cut and paste it if I couldn't, if I don't have this uh, nice QR code feature. And now I have a test token and I have the idea of this test token. And next time I'm going to log in, it will ask me for a, for a token. Um, I can also list the other users. I know that there are quite a few. I could list the groups here. Oh, it's in French, by the way. It's going to be, to, it's going to be translated um, at some point um, entirely. So if you see Frenchy things, that's normal. It's actually a feature. Um, say we go to developers where we have uh, test users. So there's all these users that are already members of the group. If I want to... Uh, meet user Joshua here, 
I could just click on the search bar, very standard thing, nothing to nothing very original here, uh, pretty picture, all that stuff. And I'm going to log back and log in again with my token. So now I'm here, hey Bompard. So when you have a one-time password token, um, you enter your password as usual, and then you, ooh, that's one more letter. And then you enter the token that is given to you by the application. So for me, that is going to be 034700. Of course, don't remember that. And I logged in. And uh, so that actually works, fantastic. Uh, what else can I show you? Not much actually, the rest is just a um, standard thing that you want to do. Um, when you want to join a group here, say designers, for example, um, you can't really join the group via Noggin itself. Uh, that's something that we haven't brought back uh, from FAS. You have to contact a group sponsor. Thankfully, sponsors are all listed there, so it's easy to, to see who they are and contact them. And then if you're a group sponsor, then you will be able to add users to your group. If you want to create a new group, also, as we said before, it's an admin request. So you will just open a ticket and admins will do it for you. All right, I think that's, I think that's all I had for the demo. So I'm gonna stop here um, and get back to the slides. Um, I'm gonna, Cover that. So the repositories with the code are on GitHub. Uh, they are all with a similar structure. It's all Python code handle via poetry instead of setup tools. I don't know if you've worked with that before, but it's great. I encourage you to test it. Uh, we have unit tests. Uh, we do the linting with uh, with Flake 8 and uh, and it's all covered by Tox. We have CI. You can use Vagrant for local development if you want to try that. So you just download the code and run Vagrant up. It should set it all up. It can take some time because IPA can um, take some time to, to install sometimes, but um, but yeah, it does work. Uh, there's developer documentation if you want in uh, Noggin's doc. So what our standards are, what rules we use. Uh, it doesn't support hardware tokens uh, now, I think. Well, Christian can answer that maybe later. Um, and there's, we have a project to track progress. So yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty good pro uh, project uh, code-wise, and uh, I think we'll be happy to deploy that to production. Right now, there are, we are uh, deploying it in staging and uh, or in the process of deploying it to staging, and uh, and are running out all the remaining parts. So yeah, we're pretty happy with it, and uh, I hope you'll like it too, and. Um, Yes, uh, who else? I think that's all. Thanks for listening. Uh, anybody of the Christian and Steven, do you want to say something that I may have missed? Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and it's 10 minutes before. So if you have questions, we're happy to uh, listen and answer them. So. That popped up on the chat was the uh, request for hardware tokens or uh, UTF. That's currently not available in free IPA. Uh, I think that it's a bit more complicated. So it requires us to write plugins both for Kerberos and LDAP in C, and that's a bit annoying to write. But yeah, okay. Alexander, my coworker, just posted the upstream. Uh, ticket for the feature. So they first have to implement that in IPA and then they will eventually land as a possible feature. Any more questions? I think the other question we already answered during the talk. Oh, there was one about um... Public, publicly visible profile URLs. Uh, so no, the, it's it's all behind Kerberos. Yeah, you'll have to be logged in to see other users. It's not going to be a public thing. But there's a link to a wiki page uh, for users. If you want to have a public-facing profile, you can use that. 
Also a question by Mohan, uh, you've seen only two SSH key fields. Can we add more? Yes, you can add more. It's only, there's always going to be two empty fields, so you can add two keys at the same time, but it's going to be, you can have, have as many keys as you want to. Same thing for, for uh, GPG. Um, there was one from Neil at this, when's it being deployed? So staging currently and then production early November. <laughs> yes, uh, did we talk about that? Um, so the people in OpenSUSE are going to use this solution, um, the system free APA, Noggin, uh, FastJSON, etc. And they may even deploy it before we do. And that's great. I think that's great. <laughs> so um, yay for community and, uh, and, and sharing efforts and code. Fantastic. So if we only started uh, for class, in centers and Tuesday, I express interest to team up and solution. We got I want to get a request from somebody from the KDE team. Christian, I, I, I'm not hearing you well, and I don't know if that's the case for everybody. Um, yes. I don't, I don't know if you have thing again. Okay, okay, closer to the microphone. It's hey. better. Yeah, uh, so um, initially it started only to work on the solution for Fedora, then Santos and Susa joined in. A while ago, we got a request from somebody from the KDE community. But there was no follow-up yet. And GNOME has been using FreeIPA for a couple of years now. So that's the backend for the GNOME community. But they're not using FAST. They're using just stock FreeIPA. Open source for the win. Yep. No login for GNOME. That's pretty hard to say, actually. No for GNOME. <laughs> yeah, I think I started to use Freeva like five, six years ago or four years ago. Alexander might know more about that. Also, we didn't mention th the name Noggin, so you can now log in with your noggin. That's that's a pretty cool name. <laughs> the other two names are uh, my. So uh, when I did like a dirty proof of concept hack to figure out how to get like a JSON interface for fast, I just called it fast JSON and the name stuck. So sorry, that's my boring non-imagination. <laughs> It was like a one evening hack before a meeting to show that it's possible to write a quick hack and well. The end of the hour, I think there are any more questions uh, you can approach the team. Yeah, on the uh, Fedora AAA channel. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, accounts are going to be transferred, but yeah, you're right. Uh, it's about the end of the hour. Uh, feel free to ask questions on Fedora-AAA, and uh, there will be account migration. That is rare. They're both accounts are going to be transferred, yeah. We are trying to manage um, com um, collisions and how it's going to work. But yeah, uh, accounts and groups are going to be migrated and uh, centers groups are going to be prefixed, I think. Uh, but you'll see, you'll see that. Yep. Just when the, in the migration, as we said before, there might be hiccups with names that are not composed of two words. So just check that, but it should be fine. Unless you are one of the two people who has no names, maybe if you could fix that before, that'd be great. <laughs> This is one of the unfortunate side effects to having a standardized schema uh, so, and standardized API. I think we could fix that, but it would take a while in free IPA to get that fixed that you only require like one name. At the moment, you're, we are restricted to first name, last name. So 
the very European North American view on names. Sorry for that. Okay. Well, thank you for joining our talk and um, yep. enjoy the rest of Flock or Nest, sorry, Nest with Fedora. And take care. And hopefully, Fun. see you next year Thanks, in everyone. person. Well. Oh.